we have taken a turn into that glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, we've spent months in the Great Tribulation. And again, if you're new with us and you don't really understand the book of Revelation, we are dealing with things to come, things which have yet to happen. Revelation isn't simply the revelation of of the end times. Revelation is more specifically the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of his second coming, the unveiling of his complete person, that Jesus Christ is loving and he is humble and he is that sacrificial lamb. But when he comes a second time, he comes as that mighty lion of Judah to reclaim the earth for himself, to make right all the wrongs in this world, to do away with evil once and for all, the lies, the deception, the hurt, and the pain that sin has caused. He is coming back to do away with evil. Now again, chapter 6 through chapter Chapter 18, we've been in those chapters for months. We've been looking at the great tribulation, and it's been a literal hell on earth as God pours out his wrath upon the unrighteousness of mankind. We have seen that the oceans have turned to blood. The sun in the sky has darkened. There's famine, disease. There's demonic creatures that are tormenting the nations. We don't want to be here for that. And if you are born again, you won't be. Jesus Christ has satisfied the wrath of God in his death and his resurrection. God doesn't want you to be here for that. That's why he's provided his son as a sacrifice for us. But one day he will come back. He will wrap this all up. And there will be no time for repentance any longer. All of these chapters that we've been studying in Revelation, they have been building up to this climactic event that we see in Revelation chapter 19. Everything has been building up to the second coming in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And not simply the book of Revelation, but all of Scripture builds up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You've heard it said that there's a crimson cord or a crimson thread that is sewn throughout Scripture. That the Messiah is going to come and die for the sins of mankind. But there's also a a golden thread, if you will. A golden cord woven throughout Scripture. And that cord tells us that Jesus is coming again. Scripture speaks of the second coming of Christ more than any other topic other than faith. One out of every 30 verses in Scripture deals with the second coming. One out of every 30. That's totaling 1,845 mentions of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you think it's important? Do you think it's something that we should be ready for? In Genesis chapter 3, that's when we first hear about it, because God tells the serpent who deceived the woman and the man, he tells that serpent, Satan, that the woman's offspring is going to crush his head. Then in Genesis 49, Jacob is on his deathbed, and he's he's pronouncing blessings on his many sons, and after he blesses Judah, he says this, and I don't even think Jacob understood the prophetic nature of the blessing that he was giving his son Judah. He said, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Then in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read in verse 12. See, Daniel wanted to build a temple to the Lord. He was living in this magnificent uh, castle, if you will. His kingdom was beautiful. His kingdom was uh, bright and shiny. And he thought to himself, hmm, why do I live in this house, but the Lord lives just in the tabernacle in this tent? I will build a house for God. And what did God say to him? You won't. 
You may make your plans, but I direct your steps. And God says to Daniel in 2, 7, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, when your days are fulfilled, when you come to rest with your fathers, I, this is my work, David, this is my work, not yours. I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Then on Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, we read, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. Do you understand? God's kingdom is forever. It's not like the kingdoms of man that rise and fall. His kingdom is forever the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And then we jump forward to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. We know that Daniel was known as the, this Jewish boy who could interpret dreams during this Babylonian captivity. And we recall that King Nebuchadnezzar set for Daniel because he had this dream that troubled him. He saw this great figure, this great image, this great statue made out of bronze and copper and iron and clay. And this huge image was destroyed and it troubled him. And he asked Daniel, Daniel, what does this dream mean? And Daniel said, I don't know, but I know who does. And I'll ask him. And God told Daniel the meaning of this dream. And in chapter 2, 44, Daniel said to this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, in the time of those kings, because he explained to King Nebuchadnezzar that each of these parts of the statue, each of these different metals were different kingdoms with different kings. And he says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Then we skip forward to the life of Christ. When he came down from heaven, ministered here on earth, and in Matthew 24, 29, he speaks of his second coming. He tells the people, he tells his disciples, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn because all the tribes on the earth will have denied Christ as king. So when they see Christ coming, they'll say, oh no. It was true. All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Throughout scripture, we are told over 50 times to be ready for that second coming. Jesus tells us when he instructs us how to pray. Pray this, your kingdom come, your will be done. See, Revelation 19 is the culmination of God's redemptive plan for humanity. This is it. This is the pinnacle. This is what we've all been waiting for, the time that Jesus comes and takes his rightful seat as King of kings and Lord of of lords. Look at Revelation 19, and we'll pick it back up in verse 11. 
now I saw heaven opened. And I'm going to stop there. Now I saw heaven opened. Here again, John is standing and having a vision of things to come. And he looks up and there's the heavens opening before him. The heavens only open twice in the book of Revelation. And they open for two very different reasons. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John beheld the heavens opening And we read, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And then the apostle John heard these wonderful words, three of them, that we are waiting for, right? What are those three words? Come Come up here. And what do we see after that? The rapture of the church. Jesus calling the church home. Remember, don't get the rapture of the church confused with the second coming of Jesus Christ. We will be with Jesus when he comes again, as we'll see in chapter 19. We will already be with him. We will already be with him for how many years? Seven years, which is interesting because Jewish tradition says when a husband marries his wife, they go off for seven days. No one sees them. It's the honeymoon period. But after those seven days, the husband brings out his wife and presents her. And that's exactly what Jesus will do here in chapter 19. He presents his church holy, spotless, blameless, not because of anything we've done, but because his blood has purified us, has cleansed us from all sin. Now I saw the heaven open. That's the part, that's the heaven we want to see open. When he says come up here, we want him to be talking to us. So I pray that if you're here this morning and you have never believed on the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, that this morning would be that morning. I want him to be calling to you when he comes in the clouds. And when he says, come up here, you say, I'm coming, that's me. That invitation's for me. Because when he comes a second time and those heavens open again, he's coming to judge and make war. See, some call Revelation 19 the tale of two suppers or the tale of two feasts. The beginning of chapter 19, Pastor John taught us about the first supper. And the first supper is what? It's the marriage supper. It's the supper that we share together with Jesus Christ. It's the supper of the Lamb. And the angel told John, he said, write this down. This is really important, John. Make sure you share this with the churches. Blessed are all those who are called to this table. Blessed are all those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But we're going to see that there's a second supper here found in chapter 19. And it's in verse 17 if you want to look there. It says, come. This is another invitation. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. And you may think that seems like a friendly invitation. It's not. Because he's not speaking to humanity. He's speaking to the birds. He's talking to the vultures. He's talking to the, the crows and all the carnivorous birds of the sky. He says, come, gather together for the supper of the great God. Because Jesus, the Lion of Judah, has arrived. And he is going to judge mankind. It's been said that when Jesus came the first time, he came to slay sin in man. But when he comes the second time, he's going to slay men in their sins. And Jesus, the Lion of Judah, is coming. So this supper, the supper, this this feast of judgment, it happens, and this is what's so important to remember. And it's always hard when someone, if if you're new to to scripture and you haven't studied God's word, and you come in and you hear we're we're in these terrible events in Revelation, and you're like, I knew it. Christianity is all about fire and brimstone and how angry God is. Guys, you've missed the rest of scripture. 
because for thousands of years, God has been beckoning us to him. He's been sending prophets and priests and his only begotten son, who's the express image of his nature and the church body. And he's been calling us to the marriage. For thousands of years, he's been inviting us to come and partake of his table, to leave the table of the world. And all its rotten fruit and soiled meat and all the garbage that the world has to offer that looks great on the outside, but has nothing worthwhile on the inside. For thousands of years, he's been expressing his love. And he said, do you want to know, he says, do you want to know the depths of my love? Look at the cross. You want to know how deep my love is for you? I knew what I was getting when I paid for you by my son's blood. I knew your sins. I knew what you would do. So don't think for a second that I want no part in you because of your sins. No, I I want all of you. But you must accept my son. You have to believe in faith that he is who he claims to be. There's a really beautiful parable that Jesus shared that has everything to do with it. Take a look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. Jesus is such a perfect teacher. And the way he used stories and parables to hit home just the biggest points about the kingdom of God and God's love and God's forgiveness. And one of those parables is found here in Matthew 22. In verse 1, we read that Jesus answered and spoke to them, the crowds, again with this parable. And he said, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, and and look at this, in verse 4, he doesn't give up. This father arranges a marriage for his son, and he wants everyone to come and enjoy in the celebration, so he sends out his servants to invite people, and people say, no, I don't want to go to that marriage. And so the father doesn't say, well, forget it then. We'll just kind of do a little intimate thing. He sends out more servants in verse 4. He sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle and are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. So he sends out more servants and he tells his servants, make sure they understand how special this is. Make sure they understand what I have prepared for them. And so those servants go out. But the people in verse 5, they made light of it. They made fun of it. And they went their ways. They had other things to do. They had things to do on the farm. They had another wedding to go to. Another place of business to take care of. Look at verse 6. And then the rest seized his servants and they treated them spitefully and they killed them. What a a crazy vision here. What a crazy uh, picture. A father wanting to invite people to his son's wedding, preparing this magnificent feast for these people. And these people not only have excuses and make fun of it, they kill the messengers. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, rightfully so. And he sent out his armies, and he destroyed those murderers, and he burned up their city, Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited, they're not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding, anybody and everybody. 
So those servants went out into the highways and they gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to, in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. He wasn't covered in white. And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him to, into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. If that doesn't sum up the book of Revelation, well, I don't know what does. And there's many thoughts about this, this guest that comes and he's not wearing the robe. We're going to see the beast thrown into the fiery pit. Possibly could be the, bit, the, the beast. It could possibly represent all those who have rejected Jesus Christ because we know when we accept Christ, he clothes us with his righteousness. And if we're not dressed for the occasion, we're not a part of that feast. We're not a part of that supper. And I have to ask this morning, which table are you at? Where do you enjoy your meals? Are you sitting at a table in the world? Are you sitting at the table of Christ? And those of you who are at the table of Christ, I have a concern. It's the concern that Paul had in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He was warning the church in Corinth to stay away from sexual, sexual immorality, to avoid complaining. Some of you may say, well, I'm not sexually immoral. I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Well, he follows that up by saying, and don't complain. That's when we're like, ah, got, got me on that one. He avoids them of just looking like the world. To be, avoids them... He, he, he warns them of looking like the world. Tells them to resist temptation. And then he writes this in 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons. He says you cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. You don't belong at both tables. You can't be at both tables. There's one feast. There's one marriage feast. And he says, or do we not provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? See, once we sit at the marriage table, that's our, that's our spot. But here's what I see Christians doing today. They're sitting at the marriage feast. God has prepared an amazing meal. He's given their lives purpose and meaning. He's given them himself. And so the glory of God and the depths of his riches are sitting in front of them, but they don't see it. Do you know why? They're looking over at the other table still, the table that they came from. Oh, I don't want to miss out. That table was fun. I kind of remember it. That was kind of like the party table. It's like being at a Thanksgiving dinner and you got prime rib and tur well, turkey's kind of gross, but you got prime rib and, and ham and, and the fixings and everything and you're at the adult table and you're like, I wonder what the kids are having. And you're looking at the mac and cheese and you're thinking, man, I, I don't, that, there's a lot of fun going on over there. And it's not that what's in front of us isn't good. We're just not looking at it. God says, do you have any idea what I've prepared for you? So we may not be at that table, but we're so distracted by it. And it's calling to us. And it's beckoning to us. And Paul says, no. That, that table's not for you anymore. Look, focus, fix your eyes on Jesus. The only reason you're drawn to that is because you don't know what you have in Christ. That's the only power sin has. That's why the devil just loves confusion. He wants us to, to miss out. He knows when we look at the face of Christ, the more we grow in our understanding of him, the more we understand his nature and the depths of his riches, the more we'll fall in love with him. And as we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, what does that hymn say? The things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Now 
Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I, I don't belong at God's table. You have no idea what I've done. And I believe God is good, and I'm not. I'm filthy, and I'm broken, and I'm lame. I can't walk. Well, God gives us a beautiful picture of that. There's a young man, and he had a funny name. It was Mephibosheth. He was Saul's offspring. But we know that David was the rightful king of Israel. And when David stepped on to the throne, Mephibosheth hid. I won't go into the story. It's very long, but he was lame. He was broken. He couldn't walk. But David wanted to show favor to Saul's family. He didn't want to kill them. He didn't want to wipe them out like all the other kings would do when a new king took power. David wanted to show him love. So he went and he found Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, and carried him to the table. He had this young boy carried to the table because he could not walk. What a beautiful picture. God doesn't say, hey, get cleaned up and come to my table. It's a fancy event. Hey, go put on your best suit, your best tie. Come, enjoy but make sure you're dressed for the event because if you're not, see what I'll do? I'll throw you into the pit of fire. Now God says, I want to clothe you. I want to prepare you for this marriage supper. And hear this because it's amazing how many times we can say it and study it, but people still miss it. It is not about what you can do to earn your way to this table. It's about what Jesus Christ has already done. Your responsibility is to accept the invitation. That's it. And I say that's it, and I don't want you to think that that's simple. Because understand what accepting that invitation means. It means leaving that table in the world and being seated at the table of Jesus Christ. That marriage supper. Awesome, we made it through five words. Now I saw heaven opened. We're going to get to two more. And there's that word. I love this word so much. 1911. Now I saw heaven opened. What's the next two words? Read it out. And behold. I love that word. Why do I love that word? I've shared this before. One of my favorite parts of a marriage ceremony. I look forward to this every time I do a uh, a service, or even in part of a, a service, watching one. It's that moment the bride walks in. But I'm not looking at the bride. Everyone stands, right? And everyone looks back at the bride. And that is a special moment, don't get me wrong. But I like to look at the groom. I like to see his face when his bride walks in. And most of the time, I hear an audible, wow. That, to me, is one of the closest ways we can get to an understanding of what this word behold means. It's what John meant when he said, behold what manner, the love, behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. It means to stare with eyes wide open. But it's interesting when this occurs because if you remember in verse 10 when Pastor John was sharing, John was seeing this magnific magnificent scene of the marriage supper and what was to come. And John was just so overwhelmed that he got down on his knees and tried to worship the angel, but the angel said, something that I wish more pastors would say and more worship leaders would say and more Christian recording artists would say, stop it. Stop it. Don't do this. This isn't about me. It's about him. Here he comes. Behold. Behold. Don't look at me. This vision isn't about me. Turn and look. It's him. This is all about him. Let that be our heart. 
as you're used by God, people will want to elevate you to, some, to a status you don't deserve. As you share in people's lives, as you share the wisdom of God with them, with great discernment because of his Holy Spirit, they'll want to turn to you as some kind of soothsayer. Some will hate you, which we know. But others, how many of your, you are like the go-to person for your families when there needs to be prayer? Hey, I know you, you, you go to church, you, you know all about that God stuff. I think you have some kind of connection. Will you pray? How many of you have heard that before? Or man, that, that advice you gave me, that was really solid. Well, that wasn't my advice. That, that comes from here. Let's, let's have that heart. No, not stop it. Stop it. It's him. It's not, it has nothing to do with me. But the angel says, behold, look at him. Get off your knees and look at the one who was coming. And behold, a white horse. And he who sit on him, sat on him was called faithful and true. Remember, remember name, names in scripture reflect nature. Not nature like trees and stuff like that. But when you see a, the name of God, or a name of God, it represents the nature of God. You want to do an amazing study, do a study on the names of God, and you will learn more about him than you ever knew. Jehovah Jireh, God the provider. Jehovah Ratha, Jehovah, help me out. Ne there you go. See, I need to do a study on it. So, but talk to Jeff. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. That's why he's here. That's the second coming. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. His name they called faithful and true. And what a contrast to who's been ruling the earth during the tribulation. The beast and the false prophet. And how did they rule? With lies and deception and manipulation. Welcome to the world we live in today. People doing whatever they can, hurting whoever they can, to simply get more out of this life. But the one who comes who is faithful and true, riding on the white horse, no more lies, no more deception, no more manipulation. That time is over, and he comes and he judges and he makes war. That's not a popular doctrine today. That's why I think revelation is avoided and I, as we've gone through this study, I've been surprised at how many people have come up and shared with Pastor John and myself, you know, you know, way back when we were going someplace else and we never got to this. We never dug into Revelation. And how can you fully understand the person of Jesus Christ if you reserve him just to the sacrificial lamb? He is. He is that sacrificial lamb. We learned about that at the beginning of Revelation, but when he comes again, again, he's the Lion of Judah. Not contradicting characteristics, but one in the same. The humble king. He is the one called faithful and true. And he has eyes that were like a flame of fire. And as we've said before, you know, John Corson makes a really good point, And I kind of thought this way as well. I used to think of this fire in heaven. Because fire in scripture, you see that a lot. And you know that there's going to be a, fi a final judgment. And we know from 1 Corinthians that those of us who are bor born again, we're going to go through that judgment. But the only effect it's going to have on us, and I say only like it's little, but it's huge. It's going to burn off all the dirt and the gunk and the sin and the unrighteousness that I'm really looking forward to. All those stupid thoughts that pop up in your head that are arrogant and prideful and, and worrisome the lies, all of that, we're going to step through and it's going to be gone. And the only thing left is the righteousness of Christ. But those who pass through that without Christ as their foundation, will, there'll be nothing left. And I 
always thought, and it's funny, John Corson points this out, I always thought that there was like a kiln or a, an oven in heaven, and we pass through that oven, but we see here there's no oven, it's the gaze of Jesus Christ. He will look upon us, and he will melt away all that doesn't belong. But see, when he looks at the world that hasn't found faith in him, hasn't found that, that firm foundation, That's judgment. We read that on his head were many crowns. Now a king essentially only needs one crown, right? Well, one crown would represent one kingdom. And we know that he is the king of every tribe, every tongue, every nation. So many believe that these many crowns represent all the different tribes of Christianity. Those who quietly meditate before God and those who dance and sing for God. Those who wear suits and ties to church and those who wear sandals and t-shirts. My grandpa loved dressing up for church and he didn't care if nobody else did. It was just his way of honoring God. I, that really meant a lot to me. He never looked out and judged anyone else for not being dressed up. And I love that other people can come as they are because they know church isn't some compartmentalized event that's separate from everyday life. It is life itself, community, family. So if you don't dress up because, hey, this is life, this is real, then I love that too. Whatever you do, do it unto the Lord, right? See, those crowns will be for those who worship with drums and electric guitars and those who worship with hymns and their voices. It will be for those who hear the word of God in Mandarin or Spanish or Hindi or Arabic or Russian or Portuguese or Japanese or English. It will be those who go to church and big mega churches with lots of lights and lasers and all that fun smoke machines and stuff like that. But it will also be for those who meet in a tiny hut or a home by candlelight. That's the many crowns. See, sometimes our view of the body of Christ can be very narrow. Even our view of Jesus can be narrow. When we think of Jesus, who do we think of? Some guy with a British accent. What, where, does, where did that come from? Blonde hair, blue eyes, pale skin. That, that's not what Jesus looked like. We know that, right? I know we can connect with it a little bit more when he looks kind of like us, but that's, that's not the Jesus of Bethlehem. Make no mistake, the family of God is made up of men and women. This is the one thing we'll all have in common. We may be very different in the way we practice our worship, but remember, what I'm not saying is that many roads lead to heaven. There's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. But the one thing we'll all have in common is we will have willfully bowed our knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord before he comes. That's a big global church family. Many crowns upon his head. And he has a name that's written on him that no one knew except himself. Remember, his name or his name speak of nature. We know he's king of kings and lord of lords. We know he's the alpha and the omega. We know here he is the one who is faithful and true, but there's a name that we don't know. You know what that tells me? I don't have him figured out. There's still so much of him that I do not understand. And I won't understand until I see him face to face. Paul says we see now through a, a mirror dimly lit, but on that day we will understand because we will see him face to face. Okay, verse 13. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name, another name, is called the Word of God. What does the word word mean? Logos, or logos, and that means image. He is the image of God. As John tells us, in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word of God. And the armies of heaven clothed, here we are, guys, 
What's our attire? What are we wearing? We're clothed in fine linen, and it is white, and it is clean, and we follow him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he strikes the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So again, everything's been culminating to this moment. Remember the, the title deed to the earth. Jesus is reclaiming that it's his. We forfeited it in the Garden of Eden. God had given us dominion over this earth. It was a beautiful place. There was peace. There was harmony. There was fellowship with him. And we said, no, I want the apple. And we forfeited the title deed because of sin. And Jesus is reclaiming it. So he's about to go to war. Remember, The armies of the earth are gathered together in the valley of Armageddon right now, right? Satan, knowing Jesus is coming back, he knows Jesus' plans. He thinks that he has cleverly gathered the nations together to make war against Jesus Christ, as if the nations are going to have a fighting chance. So here comes Jesus with his church. We're not fighting, we're spectators. It's his war, it's his battle. His garment is, dri- is clothed in blood. Now, some say, well, that's, you know, the, the, his crucified self. No, that came already. This is the blood of his enemies, as we see in Isaiah chapter 63. So he's going to make war in the valley of Armageddon. And one would think that this is going to be the war of all wars. This is going to be epic. This great battle of good versus evil. Finally, Jesus versus Satan in a fight to the death. But let me tell you this. If you bought this fight on pay-per-view, you would want your money back. (laughs) This is not a fight. Everything's building up to this, right? You expect this amazing battle. Well, What does the battle look like? Verse 17, then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, against Jesus who sat on the horse and against his army. The men of earth, the beast, the false prophet, they all turn their attention to Jesus, turn all their weapons towards Jesus to make war against him, this one who has been tormenting them with his wrath. And this is how the fight went. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Understand, when Jesus judges mankind, you see the, the, the image of a sword, and you kind of picture Jesus on a, on a horse like a knight, kind of going through and judging and striking men down. But let me remind you, what is the sword? It's the word. So what did Jesus do? Let it be. Boom. Done. Not a fight. Not a battle. Not a war. And I have to remind you, Jesus and Satan are not equals. 
And I say, where's this epic battle? Where's this cosmic conflict? There is no cosmic conflict. The battle has already been won. Chapters 6 through 18, they've led up to this moment. And what do we see? Jesus returns. The armies turn their weapons against him. He captures the beast. He captures the false prophet. He throws him in the lake of fire. Then he speaks a word, and it's finished. He spoke a word and it started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke it into existence. And then with a mighty word, it's finished. Satan and Jesus are not equals. Satan is not the nemesis of Jesus. He's not the arch enemy of Jesus. Satan is a created being. Oh, he's more cunning than any of us. He's more powerful than any of us. But he is not on the same level. He shouldn't even be mentioned in the same breath. Jesus is eternal. He is God. They're not two sides of the same coin. They're not yin and yang, good and evil. There's no one like Jesus. Don't give Satan that much credit in your life. Why is this important to remember? Remember, the Apostle John is writing to the persecuted church. And to them, it may feel like Satan is winning and that evil is winning. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels that way in this world. Because this life is full of tragedy, isn't it? I'm learning the older I get that there's more tragedy than there is, I want to say joy, but God gives us joy in the tragedy. But John warns this persecuted church, guys, Jesus has overcome. 1 John 4, 1 through 4, we'll close with this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. As the fallen world can be a sobering place, but let's never forget how the story ends. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world.